Coming up on American Medicine Today, an average man takes on Big Pharma in a story of love, luck, and beating the odds. Patrick Girondi joins us to discuss the monumental steps he had to take in order to save his son's life. Then, Dara suffered from lower lumbar pain that prevented him from sitting or lying down without agony. See how quickly the patented Bonatti spine procedures got Dara back to work and living his life pain-free. Finally, while the 2000 Mules documentary may have answered a lot of questions, it also sparked a lot of backlash. Dinesh D'Souza returns to discuss his follow-up book to the film. Will elections restore voters' faith in the system? Find out coming up on American Medicine Today. Featuring cutting-edge science and medical innovation, touching personal stories of recovery from pain, along with political, social, and health care issues plaguing our nation. This is American Medicine Today, brought to you by the Bonatti Spine Institute and Alfred Bonatti, MD. Welcome to American Medicine Today. I'm Kimberly Bonatti alongside our friends Ethan Euchre and world-renowned orthopedic surgeon Dr. Alfred Bonatti. So a new book is being called A Story of Love, Luck, and Beating the Odds after a regular guy took on Big Pharma in an effort to save his son's life. Joining us to discuss is Patrick Gerondi, founder of San Rocco Therapeutics and author of Flight of the Rondoni, High School Dropout vs. Big Pharma. Thank you and welcome to the program. Thank you. Thank you. So you have a lot to share in your story in a really small amount of time. Tell us briefly about kind of growing up on the street in Chicago and how you ended up a successful trader making millions to your son's battle with what they call an orphan disease. Sure. I was born on the south side of Chicago, one of 13 kids. Uh, my, I was a shoe shine when I was a kid and worked uh, busing tables, stealing cars. It was a wonderful childhood. And I was 16 and uh, Judge Clarence Bryant uh, ordered me to the military. It was either there or a juvenile prison. Mm -hmm. So I ended up going to the military. I got out of the military and um, with a hardship discharge to come back home and help my uh, mother. I ended up driving a truck and uh, a friend of mine asked me if I had an interest in being a runner at the Chicago Board Options Exchange. I accepted the position. Um, I got in an altercation. Uh, I, I gave a guy, I whacked the guy uh, in the head, in their face or cracked them. And uh, I got uh, fired and a guy hired me. I became a, a trader. And uh, wow. it was a wonderful life. I got married and uh, my oldest son was diagnosed with Mediterranean anemia or beta thalassemia in 1992. In 1993, I founded a first pharmaceutical company because there was no hope for him to live beyond 14 years of age at that time. I, in 2005, I, I signed a worldwide license with Memorial Sloan Kettering to bring forward gene therapy for sickle cell disease and thalassemia. The same gene therapy cures both diseases. In 2015, I started having some Trump issues with Memorial Sloan Kettering. Uh, I sued them in court. In 2020, we settled the case, but we got some funding and our project returned to us. I'd never heard of that. What exactly is an orphan disease? Explain what it is and how you became uh, embroiled with uh, a fight yeah. against Big Pharma. Right. So orphan disease in the United States, there's about 6,000 of them. There are any disease that has under 200,000 patient population. It's called an orphan because big pharma doesn't want to really do much research in the past that was that way. Hmm. So, so they were orphans. So basically because so few people have it, it's not worth doing the research according to big pharma. Yes. That's terrible. Yes. <laughs> That's changed now. I mean, that's mm -hmm. changed drastically now because orphan diseases, you can basically charge whatever you want for them. And so I ended up in a fight against Bluebird Bio, um, which was a $12 billion company in 2018. They sabotaged my, prod my product, basically. Today, we're suing them in, in uh, Delaware for uh, using our intellectual property. But they have a, an approved product for $2.8 million in the United States. It's absolutely crazy. Um, the product per patient costs somewhere between 200,000 and 300,000 to produce, but they actually got approved at $2.8 million per patient. Unreal. Per patient. The other, the, the other day, Bloomberg did a spot. It was wonderful, a wonderful article. And they said that it was a great, you know, that it was okay to charge 2.8 million. And it was actually in honor of George Floyd. I invite you to look up the Bloomberg article. It was written by a, a girl named Angelica Peebles. 
And actually the CEO of Vertex Pharma says, yeah, we're all working on gene therapy. 2.8 million is not an unreasonable price. And it's a good time to be doing this, you know, for sickle cell disease in honor of George, George Floyd. I mean, you can't make this stuff up. This particular orphan disease that your son had is, because uh, you keep mentioning sickle cell, it's related, yeah. correct, to it's sickle cell? Disease. They're cousin diseases. They're both, they're both defects on the beta globin gene. So if you can basically repair or substitute like we do the beta globin gene, you've cured both, both diseases. And so what brought you into, you know, again, as this hard scrabble kid from the South side, <laughs> how, and no offense, don't take all, all respect given for this, but how are you even qualified to start like a gene therapy, uh, in, uh you know, institute, like you're well, not yeah. involved in that field at all. <laughs> yeah. Like you said, I didn't graduate from high school, but when your kid, uh, you know, they tell you your kid ain't going to make it to 14 years old. It kind of does some things to you. So I basically just, uh, jumped in and before I knew it, I mean, the doctors are no more smarter than you were to me or, or me. I mean, it's not like, you know, it's not rocket science. You took on Big Pharma because of what they've done. Tell us more about the lawsuit you brought against them. Sure. So we discovered that they sabotaged the product and then they shelved it. Um, they took parts of our product and are using it on theirs. Um, and in the end, they asked what it would take to settle. I said, I need enough to pay my attorneys, to pay my bills and my company and to get in, and to get back into clinical trials. Um, then we decide, then we discover that they're using our products. So now we're suing them for IP theft, but they just two months ago got approved at $2.8 million. We are working um, with the University of Tennessee, University of Illinois, and we are um, improving our product, putting an insulator on it. We have been in patients longer than anyone, including Bluebird Bio. We treated our first patients in 2012 and have had no problems with leukemia or myelodysplastic syndrome like they have had, unfortunately. And, you know, get, we're raring to go and we're pushing ahead. How effective was the gene therapy that you came up with that you devised, well, your people devised uh, in treating his illness? Yeah, so the two out of three patients that we treated have reduced transfusions after 10 years of 43%, which is a, a miracle. You know, but these patients are treating, you know, uh, transfusing once every 20 days. So if you can, you know, cut that out by 43%, they're, you know, transfusing instead of 18 times a year, 11 times a year. It's a small miracle without any bad side effects. Um, I got involved in 1993. I started the first company. And like I said, John Walton of Walmart uh, became my partner from 1995 to 2004. And before you knew it, I was just, uh, you know, delved into every medical book I could find, every journal I could read. And I was lucky enough to be surrounded by some wonderful people. And here we are today, San Rocco Therapeutics. Uh, you know, we're basically got a 30 year here history and uh, we're, we are determined to cut that price down from $2.8 million to $700,000 per patient. So Patrick, uh, tell us about the name of the book. Yeah, Flight of the Rondoni. So Rondoni is a bird that flies into southern Italy in April. He can't land on the ground because his wings are too long. So he has to land on high. Um, and so when they fall, which they do from time to time, you have to pick them up and launch them into the air. And I felt that I was like the Rondoni and that so many of my friends and family and professors and doctors and lawyers picked me up and threw me back up in the air when I was uh, stuck on the ground and uh, could have gotten ri run over by a car or eaten by a cat, which is what happens to these birds when they can't get off the ground. How is your son today? My son is very good. He's 32. He's a lion. Um, and there has been some improvements in uh, the, these patients' lifestyle. And he's looking forward to being cured definitively. And he's a great, great young man like my other two boys are. Oh, and he owes it all to you. For your fortitude and and making your way even against all odds and against big pharma god bless you and your family thank you so much for being on the program patrick gerandi founder of san oroco therapeutics and author of flight of the rondoni high school dropout versus big pharma make sure you stay tuned coming up after the break a story of recovery
Revolutionary in his field, Dr. Bonatti created, perfected, and patented the Bonatti Spine Procedures. Using his genius, Bonatti invented the precise tools necessary to minimize surgery, scarring, anesthesia, and recovery. So successful are the Bonatti Spine Procedures, they consistently reflect 98.75% patient satisfaction. 70,000 procedures have been performed exclusively at our location. Nearly half our patients have suffered from failed back and neck surgeries at other facilities. Bonatti succeeds where others fail. My name is Dara Coy, and I'm the broker owner of Realty One Group Advantage. That's a real estate brokerage with approximately 85 agents today. I have all kinds of hobbies. I uh, play racquetball. I'm starting to play pickleball. I love to play uh, backgammon, and I'm a magician. At the beginning of 2017, I was getting into bed very Gently, I didn't jump, I didn't twist myself, I just got into bed. And as soon as I laid down, I felt this piercing pain in my right hip. When that pain started in my hip um, and I got up, it was pretty much confined to my hip. But through the weeks, through the months, it started radiating down the right side of my right leg. Um, it went eventually all the way and was almost grabbing my heel and pulling it up. I couldn't sit in a car for more than 20 minutes. The pain would just be too, too bad. The best experience I had was when I was standing. So I was on my feet whenever I could be. Uh, if there was a meeting and we were uh, uh, talking business, I would be walking around the table because it didn't hurt when I walked. Uh, but as soon as I sat down, as soon as I laid down, the pain would come back. It was very difficult to sleep. It was not fun. I couldn't play racquetball. I couldn't do any of the things that I enjoyed doing. Dara's doctor prescribed step therapy, which is a series of conservative treatments, including massages, pain medications, and physical therapy. Nearly a year passed as he continued struggling with no relief from pain. And that was making him desperate. Really, it was the heating pad that gave me a little bit of relief. Uh, cold didn't seem to give me very much relief. Um, uh, stretching, I, the physical therapists told me to stretch. So I did all the laying down on your ground, bend your, your knees up and rocking side to side, pulling your knee from right to left and left to right. Uh, whatever I did, still the pain was there. Once the pain started at the beginning of 2017, we tried the physical therapy, we tried massage therapy, structural energy therapy, we tried everything. And by the end of 2017, I was practically giving up. I never had any thoughts of uh, suicide or anything like that, never in my life. But it kind of made me wish that I might prefer that alternative than living with that pain. That went on for almost a year. At the urging of a friend, Dara made an appointment with the Bonatti Spine Institute for an evaluation with Dr. Bonatti. Well, I arrived at the Institute. Uh, they greeted me warmly. Uh, it wasn't more than 20 minutes uh, that I was uh, seeing Dr. Bonatti and uh, he scheduled the MRI at the Institute, it was a separate building. So we went over to the other building. I was with my wife. I had the second set of MRIs done. Within about 20 minutes, I was seeing Dr. Bonatti again, and he was showing me visually uh, where I was having problems on, on my back. Dr. Bonatti uh, asked me where I was feeling pain, um, and I described it in the hip and going down the legs, and then he showed me how the area where the pain was going was relating to the images in the MRI. The consultation with Dr. Bonatti made me feel very confident that I was in the right place. Um, the reputation of Dr. Bonatti made me feel confident that I was in the right place. Um, and the treatment by the staff was just wonderful. 
The exclusive Venati spine procedures are performed incrementally using conscious IV sedation. While in a twilight state, patients are encouraged to communicate with their surgeon to ensure the source of their pain is eliminated. Due to the patented tools and techniques used in the Bonatti spine procedures, only a small incision, roughly the width of a thumbnail, is required. This drastically reduces the risk of infection and allows for a quicker recovery time. Well, it was explained to me what the process was going to be. And interestingly, there was a monitor down as I was laying on my uh, stomach, there was a monitor on the floor or somewhere below me that I was looking at. But just in front of that monitor, my wife was sitting there uh, and watching the process also. It was, it was explained to me ahead of time, but it was still kind of interesting when you're there. My wife appreciated the fact that she was allowed to be there, but for the second one, she said, no way, I'm not gonna watch that again. <laughs> um, and within two hours after the surgery, I got up on my own two feet, no crutches, nothing. I walked out to my car and my wife took me home. Within five, seven days, I had had my first surgery and within another three days, the second surgery and so, it was pretty quick and uh, very interesting and very effective. Patients are often surprised at how quickly they can return to their daily routine after receiving the targeted Bonatti spine procedures without the need for uncomfortable braces or suffering through weeks of physical therapy. After leaving the Bonatti Spine Institute, patients are told to walk a few times a day to aid their body in the healing process. I think Dr. Bernardi told me back then, again, this is beginning of 2018, so that's four and a half years ago, uh, not to go to work for two days. Uh, my work is not strenuous. Uh, I'm a real estate broker. My agents come to me for my help, so I'm not even going out and showing houses. So it was, it was an easy uh, go back to work experience for me. I was pretty much normal, yeah. I was able to sit in the car, drive, without worrying about the pain kicking in. I was on the racquetball courts as soon as I could get there. Dara happily recommends anyone struggling with neck or back pain to contact the Bonatti Spine Institute. I kind of th look at him as a savior and not only would I refer other people to him, but I have. It's been years since his Bonatti spine procedures and Dara is still working every day and playing racquetball regularly, all pain-free. Now I'm, there's no limitation as to what I do. I do everything, fully active. I don't have any more back pain. Bonatti was the one that helped me completely. Thank you for giving my career back to me. He said, don't tell me, I'm gonna tell you what's wrong with you and tell me if I'm correct. And so he did. The good news this time is it was not open back surgery. This car is this big. He was a doctor that didn't want to fillet my back open like a fish. During the whole operation, I was awake. I was talking to the doctor. I saw the operation in the monitor. He's not really cutting muscles. He's just pushing them away. Immediately after the procedure, I was able to stand straight again, and I had zero pain. Well, he did the surgery on the left side, and a week later, I was back in the gym. Don't wait until you're on that downward slide where you can't even function anymore. When somebody can help you to where you can recover and where you can do the things that you were able to do before, you just become thankful. I can't thank the Bonatti Institute enough for giving me my life back. It just opens up doors that you thought were closed. I love you, Doc. <laughs>
referenced systematic account of the story. Um, there are things in the film that you can't get in the book, admittedly. For example, there's surveillance video that is taken by the states themselves. That's in the film. Obviously, I can't put video into a book. Right. But the book, by the way, does have a it does have a lavish uh, photographic section, and um, it crosses a lot of T's and dots a lot of I's. It also has a chapter responding to the critics. Normally, I release a book and a film at the same time, but in this case, the book is coming, you know, five months after the film. So I've right. been able to take stock of all the so-called, you know, refutations and debunkings of the movie, and I address them all, and I address the critics by name in the book. You almost thrive on this <laughs> negative feedback that you get because you then, you know, just knock them on their butts. The film was 2,000 Mules, the documentary, this is your follow-up, and it's a book. But if you can, just sort of summarize quickly uh, the premise. It's about voter fraud, correct? I would say it's election fraud because, see, voter fraud is generally, let's say there's a guy who decides to vote twice or vote three times. Oh, I moved three times in the last few years. I'm on the voter rolls in three different states. I can vote three times. Nobody will know the difference. Hmm. Well, that won't change the election outcome. But election fraud is a coordinated effort. So both 2000 Meals, the film and the book are about election fraud. And they're about a coordinated campaign of election fraud in the key states to essentially tip the election to Joe Biden. Mm -hmm. uh, the fraud was done by having so-called mules. Now, what's a mule? A mule is a, a kind of a delivery man uh, who receives fraudulent ballots and then takes them and drops them into mail-in drop boxes. And we have a lot of those guys tracked through their cell phones, cell phone geo-tracking. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the cell phone geo-tracking is in many cases corroborated by video evidence. So the cell phone places them at the scene of the crime. You turn on the video and you can verify there's the guy and what's he doing? Uh, he's wearing latex gloves and he's mm -hmm. uh, stuffing ballots, one, two, three, four, five, into the Dropbox. And why, why do you think it is the Democrats <laughs> really try to say geotracking doesn't work and they want nothing to do with voter integrity laws. Democrats are the party of the cheaters. It's just that COVID gave them a marvelous opportunity and a pretext mm. to change the rules of voting and to exploit the vulnerability of these mail-in drop boxes. As someone who has investigated all of this, how are we spot how are we supposed to fix the system, I guess, is is my question. Mm -hmm. Is it fixable? Well, yeah, in principle, if we just had election day, one day, and uh, people vote by and large in person. Now, there's all, there's been absentee balloting for a long time. So there are exceptional cases. You're sick. You're on a military base. You can't vote in person. Now, so that's the ideal. But we're not going to get the ideal back for the simple reason that election laws are made individually in each state. So states make their own laws. So there are going to be states where you have, you know, a, a long period of voting. You have states where you're going to have mail and drop boxes. So this is a complex phenomenon. I mean, my general advice is I think that it would, it's better for people who are concerned about election integrity to get involved if they can in the process in some way. Mm -hmm. Democrats are very careful to do that. They get involved in poll watchers, they're poll judges, they're the ones who open the absentee drop boxes, they're the ones who open the envelopes and look at the ballot. So Republicans need to take the initiative. If you have the time and you are able to do it, I'd suggest participating to the degree you can in the process. Mm -hmm. And don't they also get to decide if if they can understand a ballot that maybe wouldn't be so easily understood? Aren't they the ones that can go in and manipulate based on what they feel somebody cast? Well, there, there's always a lot of ambiguity with ballots, right? Mm -hmm. Somebody forgets mm -hmm. to put in uh, their, the address or they, they have a, a very dubious signature. Uh, or what happens is that they, they put a, a one mark where for Trump and then there's another smudge near Biden. And so the question becomes, well, wh who, where is that? Is that vote going to count at all? And if so, for whom? Right. So Democrats pay excruciatingly close attention because they know in close elections that kind of stuff can matter. Republicans focus on the campaign, and then we tend to assume that the election will be all tabulated right and the process is going to be fair. I think what the lesson of 2020 is that we need to be more involved, not just in the campaign, but also in the election. The fact that people still, despite evidence, mountains of evidence mm -hmm. and films like yours 
exposés, reports, what have you, that show without a doubt that there was election fraud. And they're obviously well-meaning Democratic voters. They've read the fact checks, but they haven't seen the film. Mm -hmm. And the fact checks, if you just read them, they seem convincing on their own because they'll say things like, well, Dinesh points out that the mules wore gloves, but it was very cold in Georgia during the runoff. So that's not surprising. Well, okay. Uh, <laughs> first of all, the mules aren't wearing woolen gloves or leather gloves. They're wearing latex gloves. Right. So exactly. if you see the film, you realize that this fact check is stupid. Mm -hmm. uh, or they say, or they say, well, you know what? Uh, it's not surprising that these mules are taking photos. Many people are extremely proud of having voted. They like to post pictures on social media that they voted. Wait a minute. Again, if you see the film, there's not a single mule taking a selfie <laughs> or with an I voted sticker. They're taking photos of the ballots going in or off the drop box. So that's a receipt. They're right. essentially showing that to get paid. So this is why the film has a 100 percent rating on Rotten Tomatoes. It's because nobody who sees the film believes the stupidity of the fact checks. No, it just is so angering to watch it and realize that our votes didn't count. Yeah. And that they manipulated everything. They shut everything down and then pulled out ballots. It's so disgusting to me when you see it. And I just really wish that there was a way to rectify the election. Yes, I mean, I do, too. And the reason I do and the reason it's not unreasonable to think that way is for the simple reason that when there's cheating, you want to deprive the winner the cheater of the fruits of the cheating. It's yes. like, you know, if Lance Armstrong cheats and wins the Tour de France. You don't just say, let's fix the Tour de France next time. <laughs> you go, let's take away the guy's medal. Strip yes. him, yeah. Look, any predictions for uh, the, the midterms? The movie and now the, the book has raised awareness about the mules and the vulnerability of the drop boxes. So it's kind of like when you know something's going on, it's harder to pull it off. If I were to tell you that your local bank is going to be robbed on Saturday at 7 p.m., <laughs> it's kind of dumb for the robbers to go, 7 p.m. Let's go rob the bank let's right go. now. <laughs> so I think the awareness is, is is helping and will help to secure the election. So Dinesh, the book is out now, correct? Where can people get it? And uh, tell us a little more real quick. It's available everywhere. Amazon, Barnes and Noble. It has the same title. And in fact, the cover is the same poster as the movie. I think the two are kind of a nice one two punch. Mm -hmm. And I sometimes mm -hmm. joke that if you if you have both of them, it's going to make you a very dangerous American. <laughs> I like being dangerous. <laughs> it certainly <laughs> will. And it's amazing what facts can do to put out um, all the misinformation from the left. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for joining us, Dinesh D'Souza. And great luck with continued success for 2000 Mules, the movie and your book. Thanks, Dinesh. Thank you. Thank you so much. Take great care. Thank you for watching American Medicine Today. Join us next Saturday, 4 p.m. Eastern here on Newsmax. If you've missed an episode, make sure you check us out, American Medicine Today, on YouTube. If you have any comments or questions, contact us at the number below. You can tweet at Dr. Benati using hashtag American Medicine Today or hashtag AMT. We would like to hear from you.